It's time to roll the credits with Chris and Wayne. Good evening, I'm Wayne Pyle, and this is Roll the Credits with Chris and Wayne. Tonight, we have a special guest on the show who we are very excited to be talking with. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Ty, and Roll the Credits with Chris and Wayne is the official video podcast of the Hunter Mountain Film Festival, which is online again this year from October 22nd through the 24th. And for more information, please check us out at huntermountainfilmfestival.com. Now, besides having an extensive list of credits in film and TV, our special guest tonight is also known for a long-running one-person show that he performs. And I was pretty excited about this detail because, as you know, Chris, back mm-hmm. in the pre-pandemic times, I did Becky Modes fully committed for several seasons at oh, both that's right. yeah. Shadowland and the Half that. Moon Theaters. And fully committed, it's a hilarious one-person show. I got to play 40 characters on stage. Oh so in addition to <laughs> Sam, the main character who we follow through the story, there's all these crazy people who work at the restaurant and yeah. people who call into the restaurant. And as I answer the phone, I also become the other people uh, in the show. And it was a lot of fun to do it. But I was also pretty terrified every night before it started because I was like, it's just me out there. (laughs) You know what what (laughs) happens? There's nobody to come out and save you, you know, during it. So it was uh, it was an exciting and fun and terrifying thing that I'm looking forward to talking to our special guest about tonight. Have you ever um, have you ever done any one person shows or anything like that? Chris? Well, as you know, Wayne. I don't have that kind of courage, except for that time in fourth grade I told you about in the last show where uh, I wasn't prepared, so I had to do a skit that we were supposed to prepare, and I I, I just made up something. It was my first bit of improv, um, and uh, I was all alone. But actually, you know, I I guess uh, I could claim, and this is nothing compared to what you or our guest have, have done um, in my improv years, uh, being up alone on stage in a one person scene creating something out of nothing for four minutes which may as well been an eternity (laughs) but uh no that's that's about it wayne that's that's the that's the extent of my solo efforts. I see. I see. Well, the one person show our special guest performs is called Father, Son and Holy Coach. And it's a comedic tour de force that CBS radio called an absolute joy reminiscent of the late Robin Williams. The L.A. Times raved that our special guest is a brilliant writer and makes each of his characters so believable. Mm. You imagine him becoming every one of them throughout the show. And this show has run throughout the country for the past 23 years. He's originally from Florida and graduated from the University of Florida. Go Gators. He's a, yeah. <laughs> He's a 30-year veteran of TV, film, and theater in the Los Angeles area. He also works extensively in the voiceover market and has shot, Wayne, you ready for this? More than 200 television commercials. Whoa. <laughs> As a screenwriter, our special guest has written screenplays for Sony, Disney, HBO, and his script, Legendary, starring Patricia Clarkson, Danny Glover, and Tyler Posey, was released in the fall of 2010. He's also a speechwriter, ghostwriter, and has created original syndicated programming for radio. Although too numerous to mention all of them, some of our special guest film credits include WMD with my friend Tom Keish, Beyond the Trek, El Camino Christmas, Alone, The Nameless, and Avengers Endgame. Wow. (laughs) And likewise, with so many TV credits, we could never list them off. We actually want to talk to him tonight. And that's the truth. (laughs) (laughs) That's true, yeah. But some of his many, many credits on television include Lucifer, Stumptown, Teen Wolf, NCIS, Bones, 24, How to Get Away with Murder, Boston Legal, Seinfeld, Dallas, Cheers, and Manhunter. Let's give a warm roll the credits with Chris and Wayne. Welcome to the very special, talented John Posey, the recipient of the Hunter Mountain Film Festival's Lifetime Achievement Award 2021. Welcome, John. Thank you. you. (laughs) Thanks so much, John. Thanks for being here tonight and for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to us. Congratulations on your Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, Let's get right into it. Uh, I'm very curious, as you heard, uh, about your one-person show, Father, Son, and Holy Coach. Can you tell us a bit about how that project came about and your experience working on it through the years? There's a lot of interesting history behind it. And I happened to come along at a time when the studios were buying these up. And I will include the names of, uh, of Chaz Palminteri and Eric Bogosian and John right. wow. and Great. We all sold these to the studios at roughly the same time. <clears throat> but how it happened, I was actually in Atlanta 
doing a comedy show as a 20, I don't know, seven or eight year old actor and not sure I wanted to leave Atlanta. It's a beautiful city. There was a lot going on there. Uh, we were a very popular comedy group thinking we were going to take out everybody at Saturday Night Live and have them replaced by us, which didn't nice. happen. But somebody from ABC <laughs> came to the show. To make a long story short, they pulled me aside and said, we want you to go to New York and, and do a, a four minute original monologue for our development people who want to sign you, put you under contract and find a pilot for you. Wow. And I wow. certainly didn't want to give them a monologue that they'd already heard. And certainly there were no monologues hanging around in the bookstores in Atlanta that would be original. So I wrote one myself. That's great. Uh, the idea of being this father who thought he was a failure, trying to relive his life sort of vicariously through his son. It was probably four minutes. I went to New York without any fear because I thought, what's the worst that can happen? They hate right. me. They like me. Yeah. And it turned out they loved it. They signed me on the spot. And the, it was ABC was the network. And the head of the ABC at the time pulled me aside and said, I'm not sure what that piece was, but there's something there you need to work on it. You're trying to, it's therapeutic and you need to study it and, 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 and pursue it. And I listened to that. And over the next few years, I kind of decided exactly what it was I was writing. I would never mm. recommend somebody write a play this way because it came <laughs> together by a piecemeal until I finally decided what the story I was trying to tell. Father, Son, and Holy Coach came to me before the play. I just thought it was a funny play on words. Right. Also, it did get me yeah. in trouble in some parts of the country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, could was and I said, no, 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 no. It's a play on words. But it, as it developed, some of the characters that came to life were ones that I was doing on stage with this comedy group and looking wow. for a home. And I was able to place them in and around. And as you guys said, I'm, I'm from Florida, but the funny thing is I was born up north. So when I got to Florida, the whole Southern storytelling mentality was fascinating to me. So I would have to consider myself an outsider as I would listen to people in the deep South uh, tell their stories. And I sort of adopted that style of storytelling and created this play that probably had, you mentioned 40 characters. I think I had 19. Wow. I played one of whom was even a, a dog. <laughs> and, and it seemed to take off right, right away the night we opened. And I certainly wasn't looking for this. What I was trying to do was just what actors were doing at the time. Uh, as I mentioned, Bogosian and Leguizamo mm -hmm. and these guys, Chaz Palm and Terry. Uh, it was just a style that worked for us. People that right. can do solo shows. It's either a skill or it's not. And I was very comfortable doing this coming from improv comedy. And the night I opened, um, creative artists was there and they snapped up the rights like they did with some of these other guys. Wow. And um, when all the smoke cleared years later, roughly six years later, this film did not get made. And it's funny, you could sell a a play like this to the students and it depends on who's behind it when Chaz got a Bronx tail made it's because Robert De Niro bought it for Tribeca it was the first film he directed and so that's why that right. got made and Eric right. Bogosian got his stuff made it was just it's a luck of the draw in this case they yeah. could never quite figure out what the story is but I just continued to play with it and I would I would tour, I would stop, I would tour, I would stop. And surprisingly, we did very well with this piece, even though people coming to theater going, do I really want to see a story about a father and son football story taking place in the South? Right. <laughs> and once, once they saw it and realized what it was, they would bring people and come back the next night. So it became really successful. And uh, the rights kept selling and selling. At, at the moment, I've got everything back again. Oh, and, wow. Uh, my wife is actually my literary agent and perfect. So we're oh, going nice. to go back. I'm, if it never sells, it's okay. I've had my share of sales and screenplays and things. And that really was not quite the intention, but it's a cool little story. Yeah, and so great. I had a ball doing it. I think the only reason I may have stopped, I, I actually, the last show I did was just before COVID. It was November of 19. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I'm well over 60 now. And it's a very physical show where I throw myself all over the stage. And I thought yeah. maybe it's time to, yeah. you know, sit this one out. I had a good, you know, almost three decade run with it wow. but that's kind of how i got to la yeah. and um thankfully i wrote it thankfully i listened to the advice of the abc executive to continue playing with it that's it amazing taught me, taught me to taught me to how to write screenplays but yeah fun. yeah that's really that's did, a great did story. you find it evolving over time uh oh gosh yeah and 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 how it evolved over time sometimes was audience reaction to things right so if oh, i did yeah. a weird laugh at something i didn't i would almost i would almost want to start off the show for a second and go what did i just say there or maybe <laughs> write, write it down, down quick right yeah like throw something out i was i was preparing for a show one day and there was a crew guy working the lights and i said something 
And he said something back and I said, who said that? And he said, it was me. And I said, I'm stealing it. And then <laughs> so, <laughs> the great action someone had to align that I never thought about. Right, right. And so, you know, when you are the author, you can improvise and change things as you go along. And then there were times things changed a little bit where characters disappeared or got stronger sort of over a period of time, things develop. And uh, I had a, a ball doing it, whether we were in LA, I think, uh, um, or, or, or Connecticut or Michigan or Denver or Florida. We kind of were all over the place for a while on tour. And uh, I even had a couple of companies uh, say, can we, can we put a full cast? And I said, yeah, do whatever you want. And they yeah. came in and I gave them the rights. And apparently somewhere in Waco, Texas, every year on the, uh, I think the, uh, what's the, unit Baylor campus. Apparently they do oh, a, really? a full-blown production with oh, all, wow. all the customers, uh, in the fall. Yeah, I know a few folks from Bay Area. That's interesting. Oh, I'm going to have to awesome. ask him about that. Yeah. That's really cool. So, so it had a nice life and it, it, it did. It, you know, I got great reviews back in the days when the LA papers would find their way to the smaller theaters. And uh, the fact that we sold the rights and it sat there for I was very educational. And I can tell you when the people at Sony looked at me and said, we're buying the rights and you're going to write the screenplay. I didn't have the heart to tell them I never written a screenplay before. <laughs> right. So I, I learned that under fire and the rewrites. Uh, I learned that writing is all about rewriting. Mm, and yeah. that sort of led me down the screenplay mm -hmm. path, which is like yeah. half of what I've, yeah. I've done out here over this, these uh, 30 plus years. Well, I, I wanted to ask you about your... Um voiceover career because it's obviously quite extensive and, and do you have a, a favorite voice or or a favorite client that you've uh, worked with over time but you know when i came out here um i happened to, to find myself in, in in one of the largest voiceover agencies it started off with icm before the owner shifted and moved to his own mm -hmm. dpn's the name of the agency and quite frankly uh i was up against some heavyweights some of the best talent in the business these you know you, these guys that are doing the ninja turtles and rugrats and all these cartoons i'm looking at these guys including gary owens from uh, from laughing i mean right. these guys are next oh wow yeah and i'm thinking man i don't belong in this group and as it is i never quite broke into the animation world that a lot of those guys did mm. what i ended mm. up doing uh the, the the director of the agency saw heard my voice over there, which coming out of atlanta was very southern there's a lot of what they did there. And he said, we don't have anybody like you. So the downside of that is for the longest time, he thought that's all I did. Oh, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah, Johnny, can yeah. you do Mississippi? Can you do Alabama? Can you right. do Texas? Can you do Oklahoma? And I always said, yeah, whatever you want. So I was the go-to <laughs> guy. I was the, I was the voice of Ponderosa Steakhouse. I was the voice of Pennzoil, uh, wow. Dockers, Pants, and various beers. And, and so it was it was a wonderful uh probably 15 to 20 years. And I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but the advertising community is kind of pushed into more of the non-union. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Not, you know, yeah. there's a many reasons why, but a lot of the work that was coming to us full on has now been sort of dissipated into union, non-union. So it's it yeah. not quite the level it used to be, but it was a, uh, uh, even though I never got into the Rugrats world, I had a, a ball doing the, the contracts that I had with all these various companies. And it was a nice way to make, as my son says, who does have an animated TV show. He says, hey, dad, you can work in your underwear and sit in your closet all day long talking into your mic. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, what, uh, what show is your son on? What does he do? Okay, Tyler, uh, are you, you, you're aware of who my kids are? Did you yes, see that? Yes, I do. Okay. We did see that, yeah. So, yeah. So Tyler Posey, who was the star of Teen Wolf, and by the way, they're coming back with a brand new Teen Wolf movie, so that's back again. Wow, before wow. They kid movies but he does a cartoon called the fast and the furious spy racers so it's part oh. of the fast and furious uh, uh a franchise but this is spy racers and he's got the lead and it's very entertaining to turn that on and watch a cartoon character with your kid's voice yeah that that must be yeah. really cool yeah <laughs> i was going to ask you about that i did see that um because yeah. I, I, I went through i went through his uh his resume as well just because well, obvious, for obvious reasons. And and actually, I have a question about that later. But I, I did want to ask you, too, if you had any advice for uh, uh, actors who are seeking to uh, do voiceover work these days. Well, you know, the easy thing, and I'm sorry for that ding. I have a new iMac, and I'm not sure how to silence my ding. It's, <laughs> it's quite perfectly right. fine. Yeah, perfectly fine. For, I think everybody's old. used to it these days. Yeah. You know, the great thing about a voice reel is that your calling card is your voice reel. It's probably easier to get a voice agent than it would be an on-camera agent, simply if you've got some sort of variety or something they're looking for. And that could be either the promo voice where you're doing tonight on NBC, you're that guy, or you're a commercial guy, 
or you're strictly an animation guy. And there are some right. people I've run into that can do all three. Yeah. And, um, and again, it was fascinating sitting on the couch with some of these guys. I remember meeting June Lockhart, who I watched as a kid when she was the mom on Lassie. Wow. And I walked into a studio one day and there she was. I also walked in a studio one day and Linda Blair was next to me. ready to <laughs> Wow. Wow. That's really great. Um, Boy, now- world, but, but, but just to answer your question, if somebody's trying to break into voice, it's very easy with Google nowadays to listen to, you can actually, you can actually ring up the agencies and you can, you can listen to their roster of actors and actresses and what they do and learn mm. how to put a voice together, which is not that complicated. It's 15, 20, 30 seconds of certain pieces of commercial copy that hopefully are different than the mm. subsequent one. You put them together in rapid fire and, and people listen and, uh, and it is a, really wonderful way to it's a great day job as we like to say <laughs> sure yeah yeah very nice um now you mentioned about your you, you talked a little bit about your writing and i wanted to ask you a little bit more about that could you talk a bit about legendary and your process like what your journey was from the idea to the finished film i wanted to make a little comment before you talk though um, i was actually a wrestler in high school i was terrible <laughs> I was a terrible wrestler, <laughs> but I did wrestle. But another guy that we're going to talk to, another actor, Brian Curlander, he actually made the Olympic team back in the day. So uh, if you could just tell well, us a little bit yeah. about your process of, you know, what was the idea and when did you, you know, like, how did you get the idea and how did it go from a like idea to finished project? Yeah, great, great question. And it led to a lot of writing gigs for me. It was what we call a spec script. I had an idea oh. one day. Something that was, I was a wrestler in high school, wrestled for longer than I wanted to, which means I couldn't eat for seven years. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, I was, yeah. It was a lightweight, 135 pounds. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So I wrestled uh, well in the state of Florida and competed well. And this idea was floating around in my head uh, for years. And I decided to just sit down and write it. And uh, like if you put a voice reel together, you can send that to a voice agent. The same is true here. You put a yeah. script out there and there are ways to find agents who are looking for material. Yeah. Um, and as it so happens, I found one and I wrote this and I kept playing. I wrote most of it in New York. I came to L.A. first. Uh, didn't love L.A. because I'm an East Coast guy. I went to New yeah. York where I appreciated the atmosphere more. And while I, I would sit there in many of those great Greek diners at two o'clock in the morning during a rainstorm writing this story. It was about two brothers. They lost their dad. They were trying to reconnect as a family. Uh, very kind of a rustic piece, uh, but, but in the vein of Hoosiers or Rudy. And almost immediately, once I finished it and the agent came on board, I began to get some really great meetings at top studios just saying, hey, we love your voice. We just wanted to meet you. We're not sure if this is right for us. So there was that. And then the movie was set up at a few different places. And it was very educational for me to watch the process. And, and, and while it was set up, different people would have different ideas. And could I tackle this different? Could I do this different? So I was playing with a few different rewrites. And again, I found out early on that it's not the writing, it's the eighth or ninth or 10th rewrite where the magic right. really starts to happen. Yeah. And it's yeah. easier to write what you've already written anyway. But we finally got locked into one company, Lakeshore Entertainment, which had just made Million Dollar Baby. Oh, and they had wow. a director on board. And then that director fell out. It was Greg Hoblet, who we talked to. Um, and he went he went on to do Frequency with uh, Dennis Quaid and uh, I forget who else is in that movie. Um, but anyway, we were suddenly without a director. And I had a friend of mine that had just been hired as the head of production for WWE Films. And he calls me and he says, I have good news, bad news for you. Uh, and I've known this guy forever. He was a longtime TV guy, longtime yeah. TV executive producer, Mike Pavone, great guy, mm-hmm. long history of doing great TV, our drama, um, including Steven Spielberg's first show, High Incident, that he created. Wow. And, and I said, what's the good news? He says, we're going to make your movie. Because I've always loved that script. They're making uh, 13 or 12 movies in that sort of mid to $6 million band, PG-13 family, and yours is a perfect fit. Good news is we're going to hire you to write the gorgeous George story on top of that. Yes. Uh, Great. I love that story. (laughs) And I I did write. I said, what's the bad news? He says, they have to put one of their wrestlers in all their films. Ah. Here I am. (laughs) And and I'm thinking, you know, Mark Ruffalo for the lead and all this. Right, right, right. Yeah. It's John Cena. Well, now John Cena is the biggest thing on the planet, but this yeah. is before he became John Cena. Right. So I thought, well, okay, I can't say no to that because it's been sitting around for a while. People have bought it. The rights came back to me. I just want to get it done so we can see it, knowing full well that if WWE made it, it may not get the accolades it would have gotten had Warner Brothers made. So I was right. aware for that. Right. Aware of that, even though we had uh, great reviews and the script actually made the blacklist in 2000. 
four or five or something like that. Nice. I knew nice. there would be some pushback and we got a little pushback because, you, yeah. you know, the critic, critics are not bound to love that combination. But the, <laughs> the people that went to watch it liked it a lot. And there were some elements of it that were not in the script. It may be nuts, but it was oh, a learning yeah. experience. For me. Plus, the director allowed me on the set every day rather oh, than great. saying, hey, you're the writer. We don't care please leave so i yeah, was there yeah. every day plus i i had a nice role in the film so i kind of had to be there right, uh, right. i played a wrestling oh, yeah. coach uh, but you know uh, working with patty clarkson was an acting experience for all of us and danny glover who was wonderful to come in late in the yeah, project yeah and it's a good little sports film that uh, you know america does pretty well yeah you know, right. so it was a great learning experience that got me writing jobs at other studios i was the original writer on eddie the eagle that's probably too long of a story in this session to tell you how that what happened to that <laughs> um, gorgeous george is still out there i uh, wanted to I ask you a, about that i wore my sequins tonight just in honor of wait where are they yeah that was a uh, <laughs> apparently yeah. This, this man wanted the story and i think there's been a regime change over there two or three since i was there and i think it's yeah. stalled and oh, so okay. i'm actually in negotiations to try to get the rights back because it's an absolutely wonderful story yeah of yeah a guy that at the top of his game was making more money than uh, uh, than uh, uh, Joe DiMaggio, Babe Ruth, and Joe yeah. Lewis at the time, and he flamed yeah. out rather quickly. But yeah. it's just one of the very American. The, he was the earliest of the heels, the bad guy, platinum. That's right. You know, yeah. uh, hair, sequin robe, and it was just a fascinating story. His wife, believe it or not, was still alive in her late nineties when I got. I some read that. Life. I read that, yeah, that they she yes. actually was there to accept when he got into yeah. the Hall of Fame, right? That's right, that's yeah. right. And so it was and my favorite thing to write, and as these things happen, when regime changes, sometimes scripts just get stuck, and and so we're trying to get that back so I could take it out on my own and try again. So, but I I began to get hired to write these various odd uh, sports stories, and it's been sort of a, it's it's been a fun second career for me, and I found that when you mentioned voiceover or commercial, when TV and film is slower writing. I guess I could say I diversified fairly well. I kind of bounced from thing to thing and it, and it was very educational to be able to do that. That's great. Now, now you said it's sort of in, in limbo and you're trying to get the rights back. How, how do you do that? What, what's the process? Well, there, is a, that? There, there is a period of time where they have to negotiate with you, but that's usually within five or six years. Oh, okay. Um, and then after that, it's kind of up to them, but since they are no longer pursuing it, it's just a matter of, yeah, okay, we'll give you the rights. And then what happens is whatever they paid you to write it, it whenever you sell it, you have to pay them back again. Which oh, is little, I see. With a, I see. A little, with a little interest attached. It doesn't yeah. come for free. Right, so it's right. Here, we'll you, we want our money back when you sell it. So we're working on that now. I just think it's a great okay, story. Good. Well, I want to play the valet. I want to be the guy who's the valet because I got the mustache yeah, the, and I got the ball. <laughs> Yeah, the guy yeah. who puts on the robes and stuff. I'll do that for yeah. you. <laughs> it, is, it is a wonderful story. Yeah, story. It's, I, I remember growing up. I mean, he was before my time, but I just remember I had an aunt who was really into wrestling and she would talk about him all the time. She hated oh, him. Yeah. You know, she, like she really hated him. Like he was a real villain, you know. like <laughs> it, was, it was his wife who talked to him into yeah. becoming the villain. He wasn't yeah. making any money as the good guy. And he wasn't big. Yeah. He was 5'10", 180 pounds. Right, right. Um, so his <laughs> wife talked him into that. And once he, and plus you have to remember these guys were just coming back for World War II. And yes. there were all these questions about his, was he a feminine as they called it back. They couldn't figure right. out what that. Well, yeah, yeah, that. yeah, exactly. <laughs> by, by virtue of that, he became the super heel. And, they, and plus, he was very articulate. So he could, he became, he, he's responsible for selling, uh, I think, more dish soap than Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. Because yeah, and, was, yeah, and TV sets than Milton Berle, TV I read. Sets. Like, yeah, as many yeah. TV sets as Milton yeah. Berle. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, that's so, hilarious. Yeah. It's a great story. Well, I hope it comes through because I want to see it. I definitely want to see that. Yes, one. Absolutely. Great. Sure. Well, is. you you know you've done so many films and TV series over the years, and uh, that made me think about that, that clip. Now we we talked about it before the show uh, from your movie WMD, where you played the president. And as I was saying uh, to you off off air, um, I was really impressed with how when you came in, I didn't know at first what the character was, but I could tell what the character was because of the way you played it. And, and I'm curious, what is your main focus when you prepare for a role? 
Well, in that case, I don't think they, you know, George W. was the president at the time, but they didn't actually say that, and they really couldn't. But as I looked at it and read the copy, I thought, okay, well, it's this guy. I've got to, I've got to give this kind of color. He was very sure of himself and sort of that jocular fraternity kind of guy with the soldiers <laughs> until everything turns. I mean, if you want to tell your listeners, apparently he goes to Afghanistan to have Thanksgiving and the soldiers kidnap him halfway through the dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whoever wrote this wanted some confessions from the president about the illegal war, apparently. Right, so, right, right. As I saw it, I thought, well, this is fun to play, you know, um, uh, uh, because he was very sure of himself, but at the same time, maybe not the brightest bulb in the shop, but it's just an entertaining guy. And people used to say, this is the guy you want to have a, uh, want to have a beer with. And so right, I thought, well, right. I'll, I'll, I'll play it this way. And, and so it sort of became, hopefully it wasn't a caricature, but more of someone that would just remind you uh, and so when you get something like that, you know what, I find that when you get something that allows you to sort of get out of who I am, I'm sure mm-hmm. I've done enough roles where it's just me and you go, oh, that's John being John. But I prefer the stuff that's way, way out there, whether he's really cocky and aggressive or he's just the opposite of that, you know, sort yeah. of terrified of his own shadow. It's fun to play both. And I, I find coming from a comedy background of stage comedy, it's quite easy to sort of fall into those guys. And so you're sort of you're sort of hiding behind the mask of who this guy is. And right. probably because I came from comedy. I've worked with guys who are method actors and they can't move that quickly. I think right, if you right. come yeah. from comedy, you're bouncing <laughs> from character to character, it comes more easily to you to say, I, I know this guy. Give me yeah. two minutes and I'll walk in and you won't recognize me. That's who I'll be. Nice. And uh, and so that was a blast. And they called me like two days before shooting, so I didn't oh. have much time. Uh, oh, so right? wow. two days yeah. before shooting so what did you do to prepare then just show up and go okay i'm ready for this or <laughs> yeah, the director the producers met me and he said okay that's our guy because somebody had said this guy plays this guy well and i was handed about 100 pages of dialogue and Ooh. it was uh, kind of you know they shot this thing down and dirty in about 11 days so oh. it was a lot of looking at notes and then doing little bits and pieces and breaking it up because i couldn't yeah. really remember, remember yep. everything so yeah but fortunately for them, the, almost the entire thing is once he's kidnapped, takes place in one room. So right. there weren't a lot of change, uh, scenery changes. It all yeah. happened right here, which is why we were able to shoot so quickly. But that's one of those movies that might come back one day, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. And I'm sure it, I thought it was a long shot just because of the subject matter. But in light of the way politics have moved in the last you know, several years, it could be mainstream one day. You never know about these things. But it yeah. sure was fun to do. <laughs> Yeah, it could, could, looked like it. Yeah. Yeah. Could you tell yeah. us? A, could you talk to us a little bit about the difference you find between film acting and television acting? Like, do you find that there's a big difference, or or not really? What What do you What do you notice? Yeah, in TV, you don't have as much time because they're always in a hurry, and so right. the rehearsal process doesn't really exist so much for the actors. It exists for camera and lighting. Um, in in movies where you you're you're blessed with time and money. You've probably read of some directors, Tarantinos and guys like that, who will have a month of nothing but rehearsal. Michael Mann, people like that. Yeah. And I've been I've been on a few of those sets. Most mostly what I have done is TV. And you know, once the pilot is shot, beyond that, it's kind of uh, they kind of you, you know they bring you in because they they know that you know what you're doing. Right. And I've done my fair share of recurring roles or guest roles where you do walk in kind of new while everybody else on the set's been working together for a year or two or three or 10. Sure. And yeah. you want to make sure that you're on your, you're on your A game when you do that. You don't want to walk in there and get fearful simply because that's that crew and you're the new guy. And, but, and there's very little rehearsal. They'll watch you in an audition process and say, okay, this guy's bringing exactly what we wrote this guy. And, they'll, and you basically want to do what you did but it moves much quicker. They cover a lot more pages in TV than they do in film. I mean, there are, you know, if you, if you have the luxury of a $150, $200 million film budget, you may spend an entire day on two and a half pages versus right. film could be seven to eight pages. I mean, excuse me, TV could be seven to eight pages that they cover because they have a budget of usually seven to eight days to get it shot. Right. Right, right. And then sometimes the more successful the show, I just came off of Better Call Saul and they actually have a longer shooting schedule because they've earned it. You know, yeah. they're, they're so good. They're so creative. They're so technically advanced that they need more than that seven or eight days. And you can see in the final product. Yeah, you can definitely see it in the final product. Yeah, yeah. I'm a fan. I'm a fan of the show. show. 
That's great but that that's, you got to be on it. Oh, that's cool. I can't wait to see your episode. Yeah, That'll that be fun. was fun. I, I think you won't see me till next year. I think because of COVID, they lost one season or pushed it. So it's probably first of January. Or so it's yeah, yeah. Same, same same thing kind of happened same. with us on. Well, I have to keep an eye out too. Yeah. yeah. But but yeah. that's the difference. You get in the film and usually have more time to rehearse and throw things around. And also often in a film, uh, people, uh, they may love the improv work that you do, which is kind of a no-no in TV. When yeah. you finally get a TV, there's been a lot of fingers in that. That's right. And so the last thing you, <laughs> last thing you want to do is go in and, uh, and, and give a finger to the writers and say, I think I'll do it this way. Yes. So mm. I'm, I'm very cognizant that there's been a lot of writers who have written that. So I stay... Uh, I stay there unless somebody gives you permission. If, he, if the director says, hey, throw something else in, then okay, fine. Yeah, I've um, noticed that as well. Film, yeah. yeah. Whereas in film, it may be a little bit more more freedom to do that. Yeah, they give you a little more freedom, which is nice, mm -hmm. which is nice mm -hmm. when you when you can come up with it. What would you say has been your most challenging role that you've had, had to do over the years? Well, it, it could have been... Uh, it, it, it might have been just for terms of challenging. It could have been because I became the lead in that film with two days notice. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's really days. challenging. I've always wondered about that and like what that's like to just go here. Here's a hundred pages. We start shooting tomorrow. You know, like what did you, did you just like, cram worked. the scene that was about to be shot each day, yeah. each night or each day? What, well, how was well that? fortunately our conversation was easy because we're, uh, we're going back and forth with the soldiers. Yeah. And so it wasn't exposition that didn't make sense. It wasn't like I was, mm. I was giving uh, uh, you know medical terms to something. Right, right. Short, short <laughs> I've had to do that. Yeah. And that's, that's still a problem for me. Yeah, I've done yeah. commercials where they give you. I said, I, I said, I don't even know what I'm saying. It could be right, fortunate. right. But there, and plus they were waterboarding me. There was lots of fist oh, fights. There right. were lots guns of physical in the stuff. Head, bullets flying. Uh, so it was that, and you know, at the end of the day, it was or at the end of the month, or at the end of the yeah, about a. 11 day shoot or something. We all felt great. And again, we, we, we thought well, this may not see the light of day, but what a great project. Um, you know, on the other hand, if you were to ask me what was the most rewarding experience, I would have yeah. to say I was hugely fortunate to be in the Tom Hanks HBO miniseries called From the Earth to the Moon, which was his follow up to Apollo 13. Yeah. Tom has done a couple of these. He did uh, 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 Band of Brothers. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think. I think he's got another one, and these were his sort of 11, 12 part uh, miniseries at HBO here. And so uh, these were, we were sitting in a real capsule that didn't go up. Uh, it was the Apollo 16 or 17 that oh, didn't go up. It was wow, still wow, really? You got to sit in the real capsule? That's Actually, really cool. That, that, <laughs> oh, wow. We were, we were down there for long periods of time because there was a lot of block shooting of different episodes at the same time. There were a lot of really good actors who were, uh, uh, who, who would become longtime friends. I shared a, a spaceship with Mark Harmon, uh, a guy oh, named geez. John. Yeah, and so Mark and I were pilot. I played John Young, who was a Florida-based uh, uh, pilot who flew Apollo and later the space pro, um, the, uh, what do you call it, Enterprise, the, uh, oh, right. the space shuttle, the space yeah, shuttle. Yeah, the space shuttle, yeah. And so it was, and to have Tom there directing and just sort of overseeing the whole thing, Wow. And, and being with so many different actors who were sort of in my club circle of guys that were roughly my age was really a, a lot. It just a, at one point, they gave us great seats for a, one of the rockets actually took off while we were there shooting in Cocoa Beach. Very cool. Wow. And it was just fascinating. Really one of the was. one of the joys of being an actor is having those experiences like that that are, I mean, related to acting, but a lot of things that people normal people couldn't do. And it's just really, um, you know, it, it makes me, uh, I, can, I can see it in my mind, just everything you're talking about it makes me want oh, to be a part of that. Yeah. The astronauts there were the consultants. They, they would say, you know, you saw that movie Apollo 13. They said that happened a lot. Or sometimes rockets would spin out of control and we were lucky they brought them. He said, you have no idea how we almost lost some of these rockets. They could still have been floating wow. in space. Fascinating just to listen to them talk and their stories. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to ask you a quick question about um, Alone, because you worked with your son in that, right? Yeah, Tyler, um, who's now 29, we got him in the business. Well, actually, it was his choice. You, you never want to put a kid in the business. In my, yeah. in my, they have to ask you, but he was always hanging out with me. He was on that set with Tom Hanks and everybody for weeks at a time. And at one point, 
while we're shooting this rocket movie. I can't find him. And I look over and he's sitting in front of the cameras with Ron Howard and Tom Hanks. It was like he was calling the next shot. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Six years old. So I knew he was sort of destined uh, for this. And, um, and sure enough, by the time he was seven or eight, agents were asking about him. And he walked into a little TV show in Canada and then came this uh, – Arnold Schwarzenegger film called Collateral Damage that he uh, shot oh, in yeah. Mexico yeah. and then yeah. made it in Manhattan happened where he played J-Lo's kid. Then he got a number of TV series and then all of a sudden uh, Teen Wolf came along when he was 18 wow. and he's been working ever since. This alone happened and Tyler and I have worked together in Teen Wolf. Uh, he was in my film Legendary. He used to pop on stage at the end of Father, Son and Holy Coach. There's the moment where this guy's talking to his son and so there's this big blackout where the stage disappears. When the lights came back up, there was this little teeny kid sitting on the bench. Where uh, you could hear a gasp from the audience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it wasn't planned. It was his idea. He said, hey, how about if I come up on stage and do the last scene? I said, how about you do? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> great idea. It, yeah, yeah, that's, is it, great. Um, that's really great. Is, is it, um, well, I don't know. Is it, what's it like working with your son on a major film? Do you give him pointers or? Does well, he give you pointers? Right. <laughs> no, I've always treated him as if he was another actor on set and we're mm -hmm. just kind of working together. He's never sure. asked for any. He's been at it so long. When he did this little show in Canada, there's a little show called Doc. It was a, a cable somewhere I forgot where, but he did 90 episodes as a nine-year-old kid. Wow. And, That's and it amazing. was very it was very peachy stuff. It wasn't yep. uh, you know, it wasn't something that was necessarily gritty. Yeah. But he learned a lot about what you need to do. So he's very good at what he does. So when we got on the set together, it was just like two actors who really enjoy each other's company. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whether I'm whether he's working on mine or I'm working on his. But alone was this thing where he's being uh, cornered by zombies and everyone's dead but him. It was one of those things. It was directed by Johnny Martin, who's a longtime stunt director, um, a second unit director. This was his film. And so he said, there's a moment where he has a flashback where he's hanging out with his dad. So he said, hey, can you come in and do this? And, I, and we do that a lot. Yeah. Like I've got this film that he wants to do badly. And then uh, he brought me into Teen Wolf. And then I brought him into my wrestling project. And, you know, it's, nice. it's so much. I, mean, I have another son who's just gotten into it more recently because he was a college and high school baseball player and wasn't thinking he was going to go this route. Mm -hmm. And he just finished shooting the Selena series. Oh, they, right. Yeah boyfriend husband so he's still getting his you know feet wet in the business he's not quite where tyler is but he's getting there and so working with tyler is 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 really a blast because he's kind of a mellow guy and it's like you're just working with an old buddy on the set is the way you, is the way it comes across when we're working together that's so great that's awesome and i did tell him i, I taught him how to treat everybody nicely because not everybody does that you know you never yeah. know when you're going to see him coming up or coming out so be humble and remember that these people are working hard and he, he kind of took that a lot of people will tell me what what a humble, sweet kitty is. That's so that, great. That's, that's great to hear. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So with your so with your long list of credits, you must have done, you know, over the years, a lot of auditioning <laughs> at some point, right? So what advice would you give to actors who are auditioning for film and TV specifically, like the people who are now trying to break into the business? What's like, what's some advice to give somebody who's trying to break into film and TV through an audition? Well, there's a new thing now, and I don't know if it's good or bad, but since COVID came along, casting directors are not seeing us in their offices anymore. Yes, that's so right. So you can imagine for the first 100 years of TV, film, and theater, you auditioned in front of somebody. Mm -hmm. Just as if I'm talking to you guys now, I'm across right. from you in a room. There could be producers and a director sitting next to the casting director. Some people, that makes them very, very nervous. Others want to show them how warm and charming they can be when they walk in. Doesn't matter to me either way. But what they're forcing us now is, I'm in a room that I'm sitting in right now with you guys. I don't know. I have lights and things in here where I actually shoot this against that right. wall right there. Every audition they're asking basically is to light yourself, make sure your sound is good and you're directing yourself. And this is a whole new thing for a lot of actors who aren't very confident with that. Yeah. So what's happened now in these auditions, the advantage is that you can do 25 takes if you don't like the right. first 24. You <laughs> can't right. do that in the office yeah. of the day. You go, man, that was horrible. Let's try it again. Let's try something else. You can get back, you can come forward, you can look at yourself in here. You can bring a cup of coffee. You don't want to, you don't want to fulfill it with props everywhere, but a coffee right. or a spoon, yeah. or something like that, whatever you need. And uh, this is how people are getting cast. So when I have Zoom classes right now, I've been teaching young actors for a couple of years. I have kids oh, in Australia who study with me. I have kids here in LA. 
um, mostly teens up in their early 20s is for some reason that's sort of the group that's come to me and sure. uh, everything is zoom the classes have been zoom we're starting to get back and with each other but this is it so i'm telling everybody this is how it's going to be and even on your callbacks or what they call your chemistry reads where they want to see if you're compatible with the girl that would play your girlfriend chances are that's going to be done on zoom i don't right. know how you can have a true chemistry read when you're yeah. three thousand miles from each other staring at each other like i'm looking at you guys now right right but that's sort of where we are and i think that casting probably looked at this and said hey wait a minute instead of send, instead of spending nine hours seeing 12 people for the same role we'll just tell them to submit and we can look at all their auditions in a matter of 45 minutes right. so i have an idea this thing of self-taping yourself is not going to change anytime soon and it's not even if covid goes completely uh you know as far away as it hopefully will it, it will i think they may stay with this because they found that it frees up their day at some right. point a director is yeah. going to want to meet you yeah. then you have to do the same thing but uh, in, in terms of, you know, when I'm talking to actors, um, uh, you know, you, you just the preparation is just knowing as much about your character as you can and giving it some life, giving it some backstory, because very often in these auditions, you're not given a script. Sometimes you're not quite sure what's going on. Right. Uh, right. Because of uh, social media, a lot of the studios are terrified of giving out a script. They'll actually give you a scene that has nothing to do with the script. It's a mock yeah. scene. It's a yeah, fake I've had scene. That I've had that happen. Yeah. yeah so yeah. you run into that. So you don't even know what you're reading. So you're, you're going, okay, you have to think, okay, what possibly is going on here? Yeah. And even if you're wrong, <laughs> if you created a really interesting choice and you're really connected, well, I keep telling these actors who I work with, it's just you. So make sure a lot of actors have that horrible habit of constantly looking away. And there's no reason why they're looking away. I said, don't do that. Yeah. Connect to whoever you're connecting to, whether it's anger or love or whatever, and really connect and make it happen here and, and do your best to make up what you think the scene's about. Right. If you're wrong, but you've made really good choices, they're going to go, hey, I like this guy's approach. We can fix it. We can write back and say, hey, we loved your approach. By the way, you just committed a murder before the scene. You go, oh, that changes everything. Aha, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> when you finally get the full script and you, you know what's Sometimes going on. Sometimes you don't even have that. In the smaller movies will usually send you a script because they want you to know. Yeah. But you get into these big TVs, I, I'm, I, big TV shows. I have asked for scripts and they go, no, you don't need the script. We're only yeah. sending to your size. I go, well, how do I know what's going on? They say, you don't need to. It's a new world. It's yeah. Crazy. Now, how about your other your other side uh, gig there, writing? What about people who are like, okay, how do I do this? I, I have an idea for a script, but I just can't seem to get past the first draft. Any any advice for people who to get their first draft out there in the world? You know, there are some good books on screenwriting on structure, and yeah. I remember when Sony said, "Hey, we want you to write the screenplay." I was terrified. I thought, "What do I do?" And they're quite frankly, you know, John Truby is the go-to and there's a few others, but Truby, T-R-U-B-Y has a really great book on structure. So it becomes sort of mathematical. And mm. if you read that enough and you also, it really, really helps to have a really good ear for dialogue. You know, I, I've had people send me scripts and say, what do you think? And I go, the dialogue is making me nuts. Because nobody <laughs> talks about it. Right, uh, right. It happens, it happens a lot. Someone will send me a script and I think what, got people interested in my scripts right away was the dialogue. I was always trying to be very sort of unpredictable and interesting and different in my dialogue. And it really helped. It got me in a lot of offices. And again, that doesn't mean that we sold everything or they made the movies, but uh, have relationships with, you know, studios all over town just because of what I did write. So it's a, it's a, one of the things that you can do now, which you couldn't do 30 years ago, is you could go on Google and you could pick up Chinatown. You could pick up yes. the godfather you can yeah. pick up yeah. any great uh, uh the, the great gatsby if you want to read great dialogue um yeah. being there with peter sellers maybe oh, one yeah. of the greatest oh, that's plays great. ever yeah. Yeah. And if you, yeah. you find those and, and and read the scripts and then watch the movie so you can see how things came alive and know that it's in the dialogue or in the unpredictability so so there are some really good books on structure of screenplay and understanding story and how to make the story uh, characters compelling. And I found that to be a huge help when I was getting started because I was coming in blind. I mean, imagine mm -hmm. the studio says, we're going to pay you so much for the script of your own play. And you're going, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And by the way, it's due in six weeks. 
Ah. And so I had a pretty good ear for dialogue and I had an idea and I made some changes and the script was great. And the script still exists. It's just that they didn't know what the movie, they didn't know what to do with it. Right. People kept coming and going. Eventually the reach just came back to me. So, but it's, uh, it's, it's still out there as are others and, and, uh, and we'll see what happens. So I continue, I continue to write. I wouldn't mind. I mean, I'm surprised that I'm, uh, I'm about to start working on another TV show, so I'm I'm still in the in the world of acting until they throw me out. So, so I, I never say I never say no to anything. Well, at the same time, time to, you know, to sell new TV and, and and film projects. Yeah, there's so much going on well, now. Yeah, and that's some really great advice. So thank you for that, John, and thank you so much for spending some time with us tonight. Uh, if people want to find out more about you, where should they go online to do that? You know, I, I have a website, johnposey.com. And then there was another one that's a little, little more dedicated to the one man show you guys brought up that for lack of anything more intelligent, it's johnsposey.com. Ah. Um, but it, <laughs> okay. it, it has sort of the whole background of what I've done in this world and before I got here and, and some uh, cool photographs of being on the set with some of the things we talked about. Uh, and also IMDB has a full list of everything. And then uh, what my kids have done and what we're trying to do together on this, uh, this, this, this lacrosse story I mentioned here, I am going back to do another sports film. I, I don't uh, They tell me, no, I don't listen. Well, the, Posey, the, the Posey family is a force to be reckoned with, to be sure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We'll, bring, we'll bring Tyler back in this one and hopefully that's the next project we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do together. Um, so, so that's my story. I was able to sort of diversify when I came out here and sort of keep all these. When, when, when one door seemed to be shut for a few minutes, suddenly there was another one there. And it was just really educational to, uh, to find my way into all of them over the years. Yeah. But is there anything else you'd like to share uh, with our audience tonight before we go? Uh, no, if you have people who are just, you know, what you guys have now available to you as young writers or actors is a ton of stuff. Uh, it's very educational. One of the great things, if you're an actor, that I could tell both you guys, that, that your listeners, would be uh, there's there's these wonderful little things you can find about great actors' auditions on movies that we're now very familiar with. You guys have probably seen the one when Henry Thomas auditioned for Spielberg. Oh yeah, for, I still cry every he, time I watch it. <laughs> well, there are there are many yeah. of those. You yeah. go, well, let me see when uh, DiCaprio read for Gilbert Grape or whatever, and you yes. find them, and it's utterly yeah. fascinating for two it reasons: is. they're either really really good. Or they're not very good, yeah, but yeah. they're very, but they're very confident. There's something yes. about their confidence, and it's not what they did in the movie, but something about their presence and confidence brought them to the next level. Yes. Very educational if you're a young actor, just like reading the script. If yeah. you're a writer trying to figure out, you know, really good dialogue and structure and things like that. But right. I, I, tell, I tell my actors watch these guys. So I think idea. that's great, really great advice, and yeah. thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, it's sure. that. That I get so much. I get, I watch. Sure. Them. I go back. I watch them. I share them with other people. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Yeah, it what is. they did. Yeah, it's, yeah, very. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, thanks so much, John, for being on tonight. Um. Congratulations on being the Hunter Mountain Film Festival's 2021 Lifetime Achievement Award recipient. Your extensive work and talking with you tonight has been very inspiring, and we're so glad that we had a chance to speak with you. Thank um, you. Yes, you're very welcome. Thank you so much. And for those of you at home yes, thank watching, you. thank you for being here and for being a part of our film and television community. As you go about your lives, please stay safe, be well, and keep telling those stories. And please don't forget to catch all the other great content at the Hunter Mountain Film Festival running from October 22nd through the 24th online at huntermountainfilmfestival.com. Well, Chris, it looks like it's that time again. Yes, Wayne, it does. It's time to roll the credits we'll see you next time thanks so much thank John. you yes all right take care bye-bye <laughs> <laughs>